Tonight, we tell several true stories that happened in a single night. We've sometimes used actors and stuntmen, but everything you see and hear is based on the accounts of the people involved. I've never been so frightened before. Never. I expected something very bad was going to happen. I thought it was the end, to be honest. So if I'd have been there 10 seconds earlier, uh, I wouldn't have been here now. We were joking on the way up the road, saying what a silly night this was to go out, and to think that we were so close to death. It was a bit like being in a battle zone, not really knowing when the bomb was going to go off. At the end of the day, I knew I had one responsibility, and that was actually to get us home. The wind was all round me. It was a black tunnel I couldn't see anywhere. The noise was just deafening. I couldn't hear myself scream. I remember just thinking, don't close your eyes. Don't fall asleep. I remember thinking, how am I going to tell my children that their mother was dead? She just flew out of the room. I'll never forget that. It's just impossible. <laughs> Earlier on today, apparently, a woman rang the BBC and said she heard that there was a hurricane on the way. Well, if you're watching, don't worry, there isn't. But having said that, actually, the weather will become very windy, but most of the strong winds, incidentally, will be down over Spain and uh, across into France. At the best of times, we tend to take the detail of weather forecasts with a pinch of salt. But ten years ago, on the night of October the 15th, 1987, the weathermen got it spectacularly wrong. Within hours of Michael Fish's infamous broadcast, southern Britain was ravaged by hurricane force winds, stronger than any that had been recorded for 300 years. Good afternoon. The worst storms for hundreds of years hit the south of England early this morning, killing a dozen people and bringing the whole southeast to a halt. They came without warning in the early hours of the morning, winds that hit 110 miles an hour and then went off the gauge. The storms have done millions of pounds worth of damage, blacked out cities and towns, blocked hundreds of roads, wiped out a whole region's train services, ships have capsized and run aground, buildings collapsed, and millions of people were prevented from getting to work. The Home Secretary, Douglas Hurd, has called a crisis meeting of government ministers this afternoon. Well, that's what I was doing the next day, having made a massive detour across London to get to work. Around 14 million people no doubt have their own personal memories of what was soon to become known as the Great Storm. It was a time when thousands of people put their own lives at risk to help others, and many more were left to fend for themselves. Some of the people who'll never forget that night have helped us to tell their remarkable stories. We start at the Rushy Hill Caravan site at Peacehaven in Sussex, which is managed by Leslie Hills. <laughs> We were in bed and uh, we heard our garden furniture go up through the window behind us in the caravan behind us. And then uh, the van started rocking, so I said to Alan, come on out. The night before, we had 210 caravans. Um, in the morning, we had one left. One of Rushy Hill's 210 caravans was owned by Mahendra and Raj Gangwa, who were looking forward to a few days' holiday in the bracing sea air. We went to bed, the, the wind started getting strong, and the caravan was shaking. There's something wrong. It's all right. It's only a strong breeze. No, my love. It's, it's not just the breeze. And this happens every year, this kind of thing. It did bother my wife a little bit, and she actually advised me that we should go back home. But I had watched the weather forecast, and I was hoping that the wind has reached its peak and is going to die down. We heard some objects hitting up a caravan, so we came out of the bedroom and my wife went to the front and I was in the back. I was near the kitchen, actually. Mahendra, uh, are we going to be It is at that very precise moment that the chains broke with a mighty bang. I remember I was thinking, I'll, I'll just uh, be crushed to death. And strangely enough, I started preparing myself to die at that time, will you believe? 
When the caravan stopped, it broke open, and I could see the sky. I thought that I'm all right, but uh, perhaps my wife is not so lucky. I called her. I said, where are you? Can you hear me? And when there was no answer, then I felt that she was dead. At Cowden, near Edenbridge in deepest Kent, nature was about to take its course at the home of John and Julie Pell. I was at full term in my pregnancy, so when I started getting the twinges, I, I knew that I had a few hours before I needed to get to the hospital. I got up, went downstairs and tried to occupy myself and started doing some accounts. And then the contractions started getting stronger, so I thought I ought to wake John up and make preparations for getting to the hospital. If that's right, it's Mrs. Julie Pell. I got showered and dressed into my best maternity dress and my new high heels. But looking back, that wasn't such a great idea. I opened the back door and literally we were almost blown over. I thought, this is, this is not funny. And the car was actually rocking from side to side and I could feel there was some kind of problem there. Although saying that, it was not until we actually went further into the journey that we discovered how big a problem it was. Pembury Hospital is three quarters of an hour away from our house. It's a journey I know very well. We travelled for about two or three miles, a few twigs on the road. <laughs> Gradually, as we went further into the journey, the twigs became bigger. Um, a few branches started falling off, and suddenly a major branch came along the road. I'll back up and we'll go the back route through Ashes. We turned round uh, and I tried to make some shortcuts. And at that point, we started getting more and more, more problems. Vans are turning over all over the place. Out and down to the toilet block. I saw someone standing near me with a torch in his hand. I said, can I borrow your torch, please? Because my oh, wife my. is buried under the wreckage of my caravan, and I want to dig her bo body out. Can you hear me? I remember thinking at that time, how am I going to tell my children that their mother was dead? How am I going to tell it? <laughs> oh, what am I going to do? Oh, we're not dead. With first-line teams already busy, British Transport Police were asked to get involved. When we got there, we just wondered what we'd driven into. There were caravans in various stages of destruction. The large Caligas bottles were just flying through the air, uh, like beach balls. Sinks, clothing, everything was just sort of flying around the air. Let's go and have a look at the injured people, all right? We've got another police car coming, and then we'll have a look through the vans. OK. The site uh, reminded me of a, a battlefield hospital. It's like a scene from MASH. We have one man very badly injured. The office, what was, landed on top of him. His head was, uh, it was just like an envelope flap. It had come um, off the top. It looked more serious, I think, than it really was. At the time, it was a bit frightening. When I couldn't find my wife or her body under the wreckage, I went to the toilet block to find some help. And I couldn't believe my eyes. <laughs> we looked at each other with incomplete disbelief. I thought you were dead. I thought you were dead. She was crying. She was really crying, hysterical. But uh, she was there. 
she was thrown out of the karma when the karma had rolled only once. And when she saw that the karma was still rolling with me inside it, she thought there's no way I, I, I'll be able to come out of it alive. It is impossible to describe in words how happy I felt at that time. It was as if I was the luckiest person on earth, or as if all my wishes had come true, or all my dreams had come true. There was nothing left for me to wish for, really. I was so happy. Next morning, caravan debris from Peacehaven was found five miles away in Lewis, and the wind wrecked all three police cars that went there that night. Many other caravan sites were devastated all along the coast, from Portsmouth to Clacton. Also vulnerable, campsites, electricity pylons, cranes, and high-sided lorries. Aircraft were turned upside down at local airports. It was not a night for flying. The storm hit the Channel Islands early and hard, but something was about to happen that seemed to defy the laws of physics. It was a normal evening. Um, well, it was a bit different because of my mother and father's divorce that day, but uh, as for the evening, I went to bed, um, went to sleep. The balcony door has swung open with a gush. Kristen, you all right? My mum heard the noise and she'd come upstairs to see if I was okay, as mothers do. Are you all right? Within that time of her coming into my room, a sort of suction of wind has got into my room and trailed its way around the room. And it was frightening. It was like something out of some sort of sci-fi sort of weird state of movie. It's hard to describe, but the wind wasn't a gush, it was more of a, a presence. It's lifted objects, for instance, um, a bedside lamp, but it's gone past these objects, gone into the next object. They weren't getting blown around. I wasn't jumping out of the way of things flowing everywhere. It took its course, taking things with it and dropping them behind. And this was just happening to me in my room when my mother's arrived at my door and I was, I was just, I was just sitting up in bed, amazed and weird, thinking, what is going on here? We drove for another mile, mile and a half, and literally small trees were starting to be uprooted at this point. Um, we went further, and an oak tree had fallen down, completely blocking the road. Well, we could get round here, I think, you think? Here we go. Are you sure? Just hold on. Okay. To get round one tree, we had to go right round a field, and it was really very bumpy, and it was terrible agony for me. Oh. I was worried that I was going to have a baby in the car. I could feel the contractions getting stronger, and I did really start then to get into a state. I better close the door. I was saying to my mum, no, no, don't touch the door, do not touch the door. I was actually thinking she's going to get her hands trapped. Let's put her hand on the door handle, and within that split second, she just flew out the room. Literally flew out the room. I knew what was outside there. I knew that my neighbour's garden was a good 15 foot below, and it was concrete. And I knew that. She's not going to have a nice landing here. Mom! I'll, I'll never forget looking over and seeing my mother in that situation. It's, I'll never forget that. It's just impossible. Mom! Please answer me! I started to shout, Mom, 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 you know, Mom, Mom, shout at me, Mom, are you OK? Are you OK? Mom! For what's felt like a long time. Mom! And I just thought, that's it, my mum's dead. Well, that's... Bye-bye, mum. As we went further and further, we were getting more and more desperate. John was driving the car into the trees to make a path through. And so the 
pain was getting worse all the time, but we felt we just had to get through. We couldn't be lost in the middle of nowhere. Julie, at this point, was getting worse. She was starting to actually scream. I was beginning to panic, and there's obviously no way that anybody was going to travel along that road for the next few days, let alone a few hours. The only option now was to go back to a phone box that we'd actually passed uh, a few minutes earlier. Mum! Please answer me! Mum, please answer me! <gasps> Question! Question! Get an ambulance! Turns out she wasn't unconscious, but she'd had a hell of a smack. Um, she just said, Chris, get me an ambulance and make sure your sister's OK. He's asked me, where is your mother? What's the situation? Described that she's 15 foot below in my neighbour's garden, of which there was no access from my home. He was saying to me, there's trees down everywhere. It's very hard for us to get down roads. It could take a while. I've tried to wake up my neighbour. There was no response. By this time, my sister was awake and wondering what's going on. Where's Mum? Um, well, it's just... She's had an accident. I mean, it's nothing to worry about or anything. Where is she? She's outside. I didn't think it was going to be a problem to go to the door and close it. The wind just came from behind, and it just sucked me at such a speed, and it was like being in a tunnel. Just the wind was all around me. It was a black tunnel. I couldn't see anywhere. But I felt supported. It was the weirdest thing. I didn't actually think I was in that much danger when I was flying. I thought, well, I'll be able to catch hold of something that I didn't realise how high I was. I was flying above everything, it's a tunnel of air. But the wind just seemed to change. One minute it was there and then it was gone, and that's when I fell. Obviously, the minute I landed, I knew I'd done a lot of damage, a lot of damage. Um, but as I was looking up, um, I saw the door had actually come off its hinges and it was tottering over the top of the railings. I was so frightened of it falling on me. I mean, even in that amount of pain, I had to try to drag myself into the corner. And I was just, just hoping and praying somebody would come soon to, to help me. I rang the hospital and I, I basically said to them, Judy's about to give birth. We're in the middle of the countryside, trees all around us. We're in trouble here. Um, we need help. We need help urgently. They're sending a helicopter, so it's all going to be fine. Oh. Yeah, they're, they're going to bring me back about it. The relief just sort of just drained from my body. I thought, well, at least I've got some help now. Hello? Yep, that's right. What are you doing? Oh. The hospital rang back. We couldn't get the helicopter airborne because of the strong winds. Hello? Oh, hello? The phone went dead at that point, and we lost all contact. Phones went dead, and so they didn't know what we were going to do. We didn't think that they'd be able to help us in any way. We decided the most sensible thing to do was to try and get home at any cost. Meanwhile, Pembury Hospital called a local doctor, Jonathan Bolton, who set out with a police escort to find the Pells, hoping they would head for home. We started off obviously hopeful that we would have a fairly quick journey, but after about the first 100 yards, there was a tree. I was beginning to realise it was going to be more, more difficult than I thought. We had a call from somebody in James Road who'd been blown out of a window, um, which sounds very strange and it's sort of... We just couldn't really imagine what actually had happened. I'd only been qualified for three months and it was my first real job. The drive to the scene was horrendous. There was all sorts of debris all over the road. It probably took 10 minutes. This is a, a good hour, as far as I'm concerned. And when he turned up, I heard them coming. It was just like, thank God for that. Thank you. As soon as I heard an adult voice, I thought, oh, thank God, somebody's here. Somebody will be able to help us. Having finally woken up Pauline's neighbour, Robert Delacour squeezed down the narrow alleyway to the rear courtyard. <laughs> when we first arrived, she was complaining of pain to her side, and we thought she had had some, some sort of fracture to her pelvis. The thing that I remember most about that night was the noise. 
which was just deafening. It was a bit like being in a battle zone, not really knowing when the bomb was going to go off. I'm in complete and utter bewilderment. I don't really know what's going on. In the blink of an eye, my mother's now lying 50 foot down on a slab of concrete in pieces. I sort of realised that she's in the best hands. I mean, what more can you do? We realised we were going to have a problem to get her out of there. Unfortunately, the wall was out of the question. Um, so then we had to think again. Um, the passageway was very, very narrow. Um, it was too narrow for our trolleys to get down. And we decided to put Pauline onto our carrying chair. It wasn't ideal because Pauline actually had to sit in the chair, which, as you could well imagine, if you've got a, a fractured pelvis, isn't the most comfortable position to be in. The pain was incredible getting me through that passageway. That still haunts me. They got me into the ambulance. All I can remember seeing is um, their little faces, Christian and Natalie's. I mean, I was just so frightened for them. I was their security, and I was just being driven away in an ambulance. I certainly don't believe in ghosts, poltergeists, anything, but the experience was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. It was a ghostly presence in the room. It was quite spooky. It was frightening. From the Channel Islands to the North Sea, the storm caused havoc. Helicopters flew to evacuate the crew of a gas platform cut loose by the storm. Lifeboat crews carried out daring rescues in winds strong enough to blow a sea-link ferry aground. And swift action by port staff at Felixstowe averted a catastrophe when a ship carrying toxic cargo broke its moorings. Remarkably, there were only two lives lost at sea. As the storm raged on in Jersey, a hotel manager, Steve Webb, was blissfully unaware of problems at work. Hello, Mr. Webb. Hello. Pinty speak. A big problem in hotel. She's gone. She's gone. What? I recognised the voice of one of the night porters. He was trying to get over very quickly his point, which was. She's gone. She's gone. Who's gone? Who's... what? And just in the background, I could hear the alarms ringing, and I thought, ah, there's something. Something's wrong. I'm on my way. Dived into the car, and then I was aware that there was some big wind outside. There was things happening. Things were being blown around. I got outside the hotel. There was quite a few tiles on the floor. But the tiles were from the front of the hotel, and I looked up around them. I couldn't see anything. So it was going into the unknown, really. Tell me what's going on. What's happening? Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. What's going to happen is we're going to have a look at what's going on, and then we'll come back to you. We're going to tell you. We'll sort it out. A couple of minutes. Okay, I'll be back in a couple of minutes. Let me check upstairs. Off we went to go to the staircase that led upstairs. The um, lighting wasn't working. It was very dark, and up we went. And as we got nearer and nearer the top, we realised that something was wrong. Come on, come on. Oh, dear, look at this. Oh, oh. We could just make out the darkness of the sky, and uh, it meant the roof had gone. It's a feeling that I've never experienced before, and it's something of amazement and just thought of, oh, no, and what are we going to do? What are we going to do? I've lost the roof. I said, right, well, let's check the rooms. Hello? Hello, anyone there? Tried the first door. Again, looked up. No roof. I thought, oh, this can't, this can't go on. Next one. Hello? I went on to another room and another room, and I got to about the fourth room and I opened the door and the roof was missing. There was curtains flapping around and uh, wires hanging down. And I was about to go out when all of a sudden I noticed that there was a lump in the bed. Jaime, what are you doing in here? Hello, come on. What are you doing? Come on. Who the hell are you? I'm the manager, who are you? I'm Andy. There he was, fast asleep. And he'd slept through everything, and I couldn't believe it. What's going on? What's 
storm. We've got to get you downstairs. Hang on, hang on. Let me keep my trousers on. OK. How are you feeling? I'm, I'm all right. How are you? Whether he was worse for wear or whatever, I don't know. But he was there. And uh, it was certainly, I had to then get him out of there. Right. All he could think about right. was his possessions. What do you want to take with you? Everything. I want to get out. I want, I want to take my case with me. OK, this is a suitcase. Right. Oh, never mind. Leave that open. Hey, where's my watch? I'm not going right. to go without my watch. Around. Here you are. Here it is. I put a coat round him, because it was obviously getting a bit cold. I managed to take him downstairs okay. to join the rest okay. of the guests. I think he was uh, happy, because I never saw him again. Never saw him again. What are you going to have? Oh, martini and soda. Dry martini and soda, right. Oh, you, feel, you feel a bit better now? You OK now? Once we were aware we got everybody, we did something typically British and opened the bar and uh, got everybody a brandy, and there was quite a few of them took the offer up. And it, it was lovely, it was a wonderful atmosphere, if you like. It was almost, I mean, I've never not been through the war, but I would imagine it was something like that. <laughs> the cost of putting the hotel back together was quite phenomenal. Uh, it was hundreds of thousands. When you see the pictures of the roof and the way it must have taken off and gone over the gardens of the houses next door, landing on cars and people, um, how anybody wasn't hurt, it was just totally amazing. Across a quarter of England, wrecked homes and piles of debris were a common sight. If the storm had struck by day with millions on the streets, the casualty toll might have been colossal. As it was, six people died in separate incidents of roofs or buildings collapsing under the weight of falling trees or chimney stacks. Hundreds more were counting themselves lucky. Among the lucky ones was Phil Spencer, one of four students who shared a flat and who would soon share a vivid memory. The first thing I remember is feeling some dust settling on my face. Um, we'd uh, come back from college, we'd been for a drink, watched some TV and went to bed. Um, so that was the first thing I remember. That was followed a few moments later by the most almighty crushing, um, the room shaking, uh, the sound of the wind rushing through the room and Warren screaming. Two things that were immediately obvious were the fact that there was no roof anymore. And secondly, there was an enormous piece of concrete on top of Warren, um, and he was in a lot of pain. Warren, I can't move my legs! How am I supposed to live? I can't move my legs! I'm trapped! Get an ambulance! All right! When I came to, to pull the door open, the handle came off in my hand, which was obviously um, a real moment of panic. We managed to get the door open, um, and so we were able to get out and raise the alarm. They finally opened the door and disappeared, left me there in excruciating pain in a pitch black with this wind blowing all around me. Um, so I was absolutely terrified. I didn't know it was a chimney at the time, I really didn't know what it was. I thought, you know, we'd hit by a missile or something. We'd been driving home for quite a while, fairly slowly, because we couldn't really see what was ahead of us. And we could just hear this howling wind. We didn't hear any trees falling down at all, but we could just hear the, the howling of the wind. Then all of a sudden, in front of us, this tree just crashed. Oh! 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 going any faster it would have had us, I think. It just frightens you to think that we were so close to death at any second. Tom? John? What are we going to do? Well, we can't go forward. 
There's no way we can get round that tree and I can't budge it. Well, there must be another way. There's not much point in going back anymore. I mean, there's just trees everywhere. Oh. They're down all over the place. I want to get home. Well, I think that's what we should do. I think the best thing would be to walk. No. I was actually afraid to get out of the car because I felt as soon as I moved, um, the baby would start to be on its way. I don't see how else we're going to get there. I mean, it's only two miles. I, no, I can't face that. We can walk where we can't drive. We can get round these trees. So. It's not far. You think we can make it? Yeah, of course we can. Well, we haven't got a choice, have we? Just stay there for a minute, we'll be with you. The ambulance men who arrived to help Warren found his condition stable for the moment, but they were concerned that he was completely trapped. Luckily, one of his flatmates flagged down a passing fire engine, which was returning from another call. The weight of the chimney stack, which was um, some tons, um, had gone on top of Warren and pushed the bed through the floor and the floor itself was not stable. And one of the first decisions made was to get a crew working underneath the room to try and alleviate any further movement, if possible. It was only when we started to actually look around and assess perhaps further details and look above where the first chimney press had come down. There was a large chimney breast of the very same size, which didn't look safe. You could actually visibly see it moving. We couldn't guarantee that it wasn't going to come down at any minute. With the second chimney threatening to fall, reinforcements arrived. A rope handrail was put up to help rescuers well, move in and out without being blown over. I think we ought to try and do is get an airbag in there and just try and lift it. Right. Can we have the airbag through, please? Right. Inflate. Ready? Unfortunately, the airbag was not only pushing the chimney stack slightly away from Warren's legs to make it easy, it was also pushing the floor down. Wow! Where's the Where's? So we decided that that practice would be unsafe. I could only walk for a few minutes at a time because the contractions were coming quite regularly. Um, so when I had a contraction, I had to stand still, as still as I could, because the wind was still blowing me, so that, that made it very difficult. But in that time, John would run ahead and find the best way over the next tree. I didn't know what to do at this point. I, I, I didn't know whether to sort of try and carry her, but there was just no way of lifting her at this stage. All I could think of doing, in my, perhaps my way, was actually pulling on her and pulling her up the road as fast as possible, which probably made it worse. John and Julie were still two miles from home. Meanwhile, there would be rescuers had made barely any progress at all. I've completely now lost count of how many trees there were, but we found the first batch, then we moved them off the road, then we moved on another 50 to 100 yards and we find another tree, and so it went on. Next to arrive to help Warren Lynch was senior fire officer Tom McKinley. When I first went into the building, I didn't have a premonition, that's the wrong way of putting it, but uh, I, I looked at it and, and I could foresee tragedy. Yeah. How are you, Warren? Yeah. I've had a silly question, I don't know. Please get out. We'll have you out. Don't worry. I don't don't worry. Uh, you won't lose your, your legs. You won't lose your legs. I was of the opinion that it wasn't a question if this stack came down, it was a question that this stack was going to come down. Uh, and anyone in the room would go with it. We put a safety officer purely to watch this stack, just to give us an indication when he thought there was a serious risk of it coming down, and said that we would have smashed the stack up around Warren as quickly as we could. My lift began to break it off me. Um, it felt like sledgehammers on the, um, on the chimneys, but by then I'd been trapped for so long, I really did think I had visions of coming in with chainsaws and, and taking my legs off there and then. I didn't really care what damage it did to my legs as long as they got me out with them, with them still there, really. It was very difficult climbing over the trees and I'd got this silly dress and these silly shoes on as well, which really didn't help, so they got uh, quickly discarded. Worse 
Everybody out! That's right, Barry. Morally, I had to tell the crew that I thought that they might uh, not get through the night. Now, the wind's picking up. It's not, it's not eased off at all. It's picking up. It's going to come down. Now, I'm not going to order you back in there. It's a volunteer own job, all right? Well, who's going to get him out of weekend? Okay, you're right. Let's happy. get okay, right. Here we go. It wasn't a, a brave thing. It wasn't, um, you know, something that I'm going to be a hero, I'm going to be brave. It was more the thing that we are his only hope. and then felt that the baby would be born very imminently then. I was trying to G Julie on. I wanted to get her back home because inside, the last thing I actually wanted was to, to deliver the baby. It's clear. Let's get him out. Get him out. Quick. Quick as you can. Come on. You could be ripped him out of the bed, and more or less slung him out of the room, almost in a panic, really, because yeah, what you don't want is you don't want the last ten seconds to be the ten seconds when uh, it all comes down on you. Okay. I'll come round. Warren, effectively, is a very lucky man. He cheated death twice in one night, and there's not many people can say that. Two more rounds. Right, down. The relief was amazing. I went to see the fire brigade to, to thank them for basically saved my life. And they were telling their recollection of the evening and they, they were mentioning this other chimney, which I'd never heard of. And to find that men who, who don't know me, they're total strangers, had gone in there to risk their own lives to save mine. It was a very humbling experience. It was, I was choked. It was, um, yeah, I couldn't believe it. The emergency services dealt with an unexpected and unprecedented volume of 999 calls. Essex Fire and Rescue dealt with 5,000 calls in two days, a third of their normal annual total. It might have been more, but phone lines were down all over. Everywhere, additional crews were drafted in from off-duty shifts to put every available rescue vehicle on the road. Another vehicle on the road in the small hours was driven by a milkman, Keith Joy. Oh, I've, I've been in Milton for coming up to 18 years now. I haven't missed a day yet. It might have been a bit on the late side, but they've got it eventually. <laughs> Loaded up my van, set off. The wind was beginning to get up a little bit. Uh, there was one or two dustbin lids floating about, one or two branches, uh, one or two cable telephone wires flapping about, but nothing to stop the, the flow, you know, and, and it was delivering the milk no problem at all started to go down the hill towards my next calls. And uh, there was one tree with a fairly big branch had broken off, and uh, it took me about a quarter of an hour to get past it, but managed to just squeeze through. And so I thought, oh, I don't fancy doing that sort of thing again. Uh, well, I, I'd driven about 50 yards, and uh, there was a tree across the road, fairly big one. No way would I get past there. So I thought, well, what shall I do? Sit here and wait, or? head back to the depot, make a cup of tea or something. Decided that I would turn round and head back. Gone about 100 yards, and there was another tree. Oh. So I was caught in between two trees. I uh, thought, what am I going to do now? Then I thought, well, nobody's going to pinch the van because they couldn't move it. Started to walk back to, towards the depot. I couldn't have been more than about uh, 15 yards away, 10, 15 yards away. Uh, it was really it was, it was as quick as that. The branches of the tree that fell couldn't have missed me more, more than a couple of three yards. It really was uh, a frightening thing. 
I remember the next thing, I was lying flat on the ground and I think I shed a tear or two. Although there was nothing left of the cab at all, amazingly, only 20 pints were smashed and uh, I sold the milk to the people in the village. I always say that I'll never win the lottery because I used all my luck up when I married my wife, but I think I had a little bit of luck left over that night. Somebody had some for me. It's seven o'clock on Friday the 16th of October. The headlines this morning, severe gales overnight have wreaked havoc over southern Britain. The appalling weather has led to scores of accidents throughout southern England. Two firemen were killed when a tree blew onto their engine at Highcliffe in Dorset. Winds of up to 110 miles per hour have been recorded on Guernsey and in London of 94 miles per hour, the highest since records began. Now it's not often we can use the word chaos without a slight twinge of guilt that we might be exaggerating the situation, but there is no exaggeration this morning. The south of England is in a state of chaos. That's how much of Britain woke up to the news. But in those early hours, millions of people struggled to come to terms with the devastation on their own doorsteps, unaware of the scale of it. In all, 19 people lost their lives, and thousands more had lucky escapes, among them John and Julie Pell, who finally arrived home six hours after setting out on a journey that should have taken 45 minutes. Get yourself into that bed. Here we go. I just want to sit down. Let oh. me have your coat. I was so relieved to get home. I thought I was safe and everything was going to be all right now. And I climbed into my bed and then I started to feel strange pains and I could feel that the baby was on its way, but it didn't feel quite right to me. Go and I began to get a little worried that I did really need a doctor straight away and we didn't know if there was one coming or if anybody knew where we were even. There is a touch of the Dunkirk spirit breaking through the programme this morning. No lights in the Today programme office because of the power cuts and there's a strong smell of diesel fumes drifting through Broadcasting House because we're operating on standby generators. What about damage? You said there'd been a lot of damage. Yes, it's been widespread and the emergency services are at full stretch. Oh! Oh! Southern and eastern region train services have been cancelled and in some areas all major roads are said to be blocked. Oh. 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 We heard them shouting outside that the police had arrived and two policemen came down the drive um, with the doctor. There was Mrs. Pell, her husband and a friend, and they were all, I think, anticipating to have to do a home delivery by themselves until I turned up, so I think they were probably quite relieved oh. to see somebody that knew what to do. We started chatting to the doctor, and unfortunately he confided in us that he hadn't actually delivered a baby before, which didn't do a lot for our confidence at the time. Oh. 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 The army's been called in at several different places by fire brigades to help out. And as you say, we, we haven't got the full picture yet by a long shot. I mean, there must be an awful lot of things happening we don't yet know about. Nick Marks, a keeper at Howlett's Wildlife Park, didn't yet know about something that could become headline news. I awoke early that Friday and realised that uh, something serious had happened and basically needed to go around and see what damage had been done, the situation could have been just total catastrophe. As I approached, I realised there was a problem at Khan's enclosure. One branch had fallen on the fence, flattening the fence and spanning the moat, so effectively acting as a drawbridge for anybody inside. <laughs> Obviously, the most important thing was to keep Khan in his enclosure. Should he escape, right. he would be right. so incredibly dangerous that there would probably be no alternative but to shoot him. Steve, Steve, can I have a chainsaw, please, to sort this branch out? The damage he could cause in quite a short space of time uh, would not bear thinking about. Um, and it would obviously have, uh, it would have broken my heart to have to destroy him. 
Are you all right? Yeah, it's all right. It's all right. Just get yourself. Okay. It's all right. It'll be a bit of noise. I asked for a chainsaw to be brought so that I could cut up the bow, uh, just drop it in the moat would have been sufficient, just get it out of the way. It was just something to contain him, just for his own and everybody else's safety. I was extremely fond of Khan, uh, and he was a dear friend, but he was a devil, and I certainly wouldn't want him to see my back for too long. The whole episode to calm Khan down, to send for the chainsaw, log the branch, and uh, re erect temporarily the, the fence, in, in all probably took about 20 minutes. Basically, there was no time for thinking about anything. It was just a question of pressing on, get one thing sorted just good enough, and then get on to the next. Basically, um, I reckon that we got off incredibly lightly. Uh, we did have a clouded leopard actually escape. They aren't uh, particularly dangerous, and uh, about a week later, he was recaptured totally unharmed. This, in fact, made the news, but it wasn't anything like uh, the big story that Khan escaping uh, would have been, and, and thank God that didn't happen. The clear-up operation by householders, engineers, council workers and firemen was now underway. With 15 million trees uprooted, the job would take years. But by mid-morning, Julie Pell's ordeal was almost over. Oh. Oh. It was beginning to drag on rather too long, and under normal circumstances, one would have gone on to a caesarean section. Obviously, that's not possible at home. We're going to need forceps. Oh. Shall I try and get some from the cottage hospital? At one point, it looked as if it was all going to go wrong. Oh. I won't be long. Mr. Pell was dispatched to bring up the necessary equipment, oh. but... Suddenly, the baby started to move again, and, and it all turned out uh, all right. The baby was born about 11 o'clock in the morning in the end, and just after she'd been born, John burst through the door with the forceps, um, and so he just missed it by minutes. Is she gorgeous? <sighs> Which he, he was quite upset about, but uh, relieved as well, I think. <laughs> we called her Andrea Gale to remind us of the hurricane, as if we'd forget. I just hope she appreciates what we went through for her. Well, Ian, you chaps were a fat lot of good last night. I admit, I admit, we weren't forecasting hurricane force winds, and that's what we got, and that's what we will get maybe once every 50 years, maybe once a lifetime. Well, are you weathermen just shrugging your shoulders as a result no, of all this, not. or is there an I inquest think... going on down there at the weather centre? Well, there is, at this very minute, and there will be for the next several months. We are getting better and better. This one, uh, just stronger than we thought. Peace soon returned to Peacehaven, where...